I got friends, only wanna talk business. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I've been reading all the work. And I've been shutting down the stars. And welcome to Put That Coffee Down, the Freight Sells Show for Closers. My name is Kevin Hill. I'm your host, as usual, here on Freight Waves TV. It's 12 p.m. Eastern Time on Tuesdays. And we're here every single week talking about sales in the, the freight industry. We have a great guest for you today. It's uh, Dave McCoy. He's a VP of Sales over at Bit Freighter. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the history of EDI and that you know, really the, the technology that's really entered the market and has uh, made it easier for freight brokerages of all sizes uh, and also carriers to actually do more business, grow their businesses, grow their margins, and uh, be able to, to service clients uh, much better than traditionally, even five or, or 10 years ago. And uh, a lot of what's gone on in the freight industry kind of centers around disruption. So I want to talk to a little bit about disruption before we brought in Dave and what exactly is uh, disruption. And I was reading in a Harvard Business Review article. They're always fascinating. They have great topics in, in, on, on sales and strategy and, and corporate strategy um, that, uh, you know, subscription based. But you can always get an article or two every month. And I encourage everybody to go out and read, you know, whenever you Google something about sales and you see a HBR or Harvard Business Review, go in, read the article. It's, it's great research and it's, uh, it's a classic publication that's been out there uh, forever. But what exactly is disruption? Uh, in 1995, disruptive innovation was, was coined. And over the last 30 years, uh, the, the word has been probably the, the biggest buzzword in business and technology and startups, and it's kind of lost its, its meanings. And you really, really think about disruption as we're going to really focus in on underserved markets. So you have new categories. So you have new technology, new processes that create a new techno or new category. You think of Netflix. Netflix is a great example. Um, you had video stores when I was growing up. You had the Blockbuster on the corner. You had uh, the, the neighborhood a video store that you know everyone opened up before they opened up pager stores and and cell phone stores and now vape stores or, or whatever you have. There's always a new craze of retail storefronts that small business owners jump into. But you know every town had a, a blockbuster or some other Hollywood video was a, a big video uh, place. But then everything went online and Netflix started out with CDs, of course, that through the mail order. And then when the technology became available became a streaming service. Now everything is a streaming service. So they created a new category. But I want to talk more about underserved markets. So incumbents come along, right? Incumbents have done something really well. You know, they've grown, they've become profitable. Uh, industry leaders usually have a top market share. But over time, they're going to focus more on their, their key customers who take the, the most amount of time and who are the most profitable. And they are going to tailor their services around that. That means there, there's a lot, there's a huge swath of the market or any in industry that's underserved. So you have a lot of disruption in underserved markets. So underserved, underserved markets, you have new, new entrants that, that will come in, usually, especially in the last 10, 15, 20 years with better technology, um, they don't have the legacy technology uh, that they start from scratch and tailor their services around the underserved market. Now, as they become more successful, more mainstream or more of those highly profitable co companies enter their world. And that is where Harvard Business Review defines where disruption uh, begins. So it is when new entrants come in that they come in, that they serve, that they tailor their services around an underserved market. So the usually those are the small and medium-sized businesses. They come in uh, where those are ignored or just too cost prohibitive for their services to, to really adopt on a massive scale. And what we've seen in freight tech uh, across a lot of different things, we go with TMSs, we can go with um, digital freight matching has, has been a, a huge boom over the last five or six years where it's too expensive to the, get in the game. But now there's a, there's a plethora of tools 
to, to go out. You don't have to worry about building it yourself or the legacy integrations um, or updates to a lot of the technology. You can go out and buy it off the shelf. And you can buy off the shelf what the, the largest um, largest freight brokerages in the world use and offer those same services to your customers. So part of disruption is you know on an industry scale, but it's also on a company scale too. So if you think about integrating technology to disrupt your own sales process or bundling those services or selling in a way that no one else is doing and attacking an under, underserved market, you'll see success. And I think that underserved market a lot of time has to do with niches as well. And niches have the riches um, because you can concentrate on one particular thing and then branch out after that. But I encourage you to to go read. You can go Google um, Harvard Business Review. What is disruptive innovation? It's a great study article that they have on the website. And you can read it for free and um, start thinking and start percolating, start marinating those ideas in your head of how you can employ the concept of disruption into your company, into your market, into your sales process and earn more money, win more business today. But with all that said, let's uh, bring on David McCoy over at Bit Freighter. He's the VP of sales onto the show to talk about... EDI stuff. How are you doing today, Dave? Oh, I can't, I, I can't hear you. Um, let's see. You might be on mute. Dave, you no. there? Oh, you, you are there now. I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Loud and clear. Okay, How good. are you doing today? Good, man. How are you? I, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's good to see you too. Yeah, yeah. And I talked a little bit about disruption, and and just uh, before we dive into the bit freighter and, and yourself, I mean, what are you, some of your thoughts on on disruption and uh, disruptive innovation, and what that means? Yeah, it's it's a fun uh, it's a fun niche to be in. You said niches have riches. I like that. Um, uh, like another example, I was hearing you tell some examples on on disruption and. And, uh, and one that we identify ourselves with is like the, the old cell phone days where we were all waiting until nine o'clock to make phone calls, or we were waiting until a certain time to do text messages and all that. And because each text message or phone call after, like before a certain time was, was, uh, on your bill and it was uh, very transactional based and, and then I think it was uh, Verizon that came along. I don't know how many people are going to remember this. You probably do because we're about the oh, same yeah. age. But um, Verizon, I think, came along and, and changed everything. And they, they came along with an unlimited approach, an unlimited messaging. Don't worry about what time you're making phone calls. Don't worry about those texts. It's all completely unlimited. And it changed everything. And it was disruptive. And, and that's... Uh, I don't think we we realized this when we started Bitfreighter, but the more we started thinking about like our unlimited approach to EDI transactions and and uh, that that model, it's it's very similar to what Verizon did. You're exactly right, and and we talked last week, and that's where I started thinking about disruption, and it's a great example with with Verizon, you know. And, and before Verizon, you kind of had those phone cards where you could get discounted rates and 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 all yeah. that, but yeah, the, the status quo, the standard was, you know, it's going to be very expensive during the business day to, to, to make calls. And you, you had to, to really use it for business purposes. Then after nine o'clock, you could talk all you wanted to. It's unlimited after nine o'clock. So you can talk all night to your friends and, and family. And the, the, the established players. That oh, yeah, I forgot about that, friends. too. The friends and family, like you couldn't, you, if there was yes. like friends and family, you could add the phone numbers to it and. Yeah. And like, it's, yeah. it's funny because that was so ingrained in everybody. Like, mm -hmm. like this is just the way it is. And, and before that there was just landlines and that wasn't the way it is, but then the cell phone market cropped up and, yeah. and it was just like, yeah. it was ingrained in everybody. It's a stigma. And so um, no one really thought outside of that until Verizon came along and, and it just like, it just made sense. And so that's the way it is now. It's the way it always has been. And, 
now that's just the way it is. So maybe we'll, uh, someone will disrupt that model somehow. I don't know. Well, you know, you talk about landlines. Landlines were disrupted by cell phones. Cell phones were, were you know, they're, the, the way they're built were disrupted by a, a player of Verizon. Uh, but the incumbents don't really have, it didn't really have an incentive to, to change the, their model, right? Until a disruptive uh, sales process, right? And, and that disruptive, I, I think Verizon, uh, whenever that came in, it was probably because of, you know, I'll say technology, but probably cell cell tower coverage had matured to uh, a point and the business had, had matured to a point to where there was additional bandwidth out there that could be used. And Verizon took advantage of that and offered uh, as a service, right? A billing plan that appealed to everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah it was, it was along the line of, uh, you know, as we started getting going and, and offering unlimited transactions for for EDI, an unlimited model across the board with all of our pricing, that we we all of a sudden it hit me like this is exactly what Verizon did, and it's mm-hmm. uh, it changed everything, and now we're here to change everything too. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about Bitfreighter, and also for for those out there who are unfamiliar with kind of the history of EDI or what that is exactly, you know, a, a little beef, uh, brief background about the, the history of EDI and, and Bitfreighter. Yeah, the history of EDI actually goes back very far. Um, I mean, I, I've traced it back to like the 1940s uh, <laughs> as far as like in the airline industry, getting getting messages to and from a, a, a cockpit. So it's a, it's a little different, obviously, since then. But in our industry, it's it's uh, it's been around for twenty plus years, um, and essentially, it, all it is is it's the the technology of getting information from one system to another. So you have, you know, two se- separate systems that are written in completely different languages, and you need to instantly transfer language from one system to another. And so, in our world, that typically revolves around a shipper system a shipper transportation management system, having data in that system and instantly sending it over to one of their carriers via this EDI. And, and uh, so that, I mean, that's really all it is, is just getting information that's in one system, translating it and, and having it show up in a completely separate system written in a completely separate language. And and most of that, I mean, that's where electron, you know, electronic tenders and and things like that. Um, how shippers and, and carriers and, and freight brokerages, three PL and intermediaries, have communicated back and forth, um, as you said, for twenty years now. Yeah, probably. I mean, more than that, definitely. Um, yeah, EDI does the. I mean, load tenders, uh, status updates, acknowledgements, um, invoicing. So all of that is uh, completely automated, and and yeah, it's it's been around for twenty plus years. Um, I mean, you could probably trace it back thirty years, and um, it's kind of interesting that this technology has been around for so long, and there's been this stigma over it that it's like a necessary evil in our industry, and. Uh, so I spent, I spent like 12 years at DAT and I managed hundreds of accounts that used the DAT TMS and visited brokers all over the place. And, and anytime that we talked about EDI and integration with their shippers, there was like, oh, we don't, we don't want to get into that unless we have to. And like that, that's a shame really when you think about it, because this industry could have been automated for 20 plus years. I mean, brokers could have had full automation across their entire business for 20 plus years. And it just didn't happen because it's expensive. It's painful that that those were the stigmas around EDI. And, and yeah, uh, I, I, I was a, a small freight broker, uh, you know, I, I worked for small freight brokerages and it was painful. It was painful because you'd, you'd land a customer, you, you need to, to do the, the EDI integration. Uh, it took a long time. It was confusing. 
Uh, it was expensive. And at the end of the day, it was risky because I got a yes today to, to get on 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 the shipper's book. That might not be a yes tomorrow. You know, the market might change. Their situation might change. Someone else might come in. An incumbent might come in that's already moving freight and offer for a better deal because those those those, those you know those arrangements weren't firm, right? So by the time you got EDI set up, everything might have changed. So it was risky. So that is a perfect mm. window for for Bitfreighter and Bitfreighter coming in. So explain a little bit about Bitfreighter, what you guys do. And what problems that, that you're addressing? Yeah, it all kind of came about uh, when I was still at, at DAT and managing those accounts that, that used our TMS. And, and uh, like I was saying, I was, getting, I was getting calls like once or twice a month from people saying, is there anything else out there for EDI? I'm paying two, $3,000 a month for maybe just like one shipper. And that's crazy. Is there any other options out there? And the answer was always no. That's, I mean, this is just the way it is. It's the way it is. And, and one of those calls was someone who decided to do something about it. And that was Brad Perling. Uh, he, he's our CEO and, and he uh, started a couple brokers and one of those brokers used our TMS. And so we, we got to have a, a close relationship and, and yeah, he made that phone call to me. I told him the same thing I told everybody. And he left that with why, why is this the only way and started researching it. And he found a tool for his own brokerage that, that solved that, that issue with that shipper, but still his mind was working. Like there's something out there is, there's something that, that we could change here in this industry. And so, um, he stepped back from the brokerage. He found a developer, they teamed up, started Bitfreighter. And with the idea of let's not do transactional anything, let's make everything unlimited because EDI and that automation behind it should be rolled out to an entire brokerage. It should be a way to automate an entire brokerage. And, and so, yeah, we, we came in with an unlimited message uh, model. So what that means is like right now with EDI, it's very transactional based in our industry and has been for that 20 plus years to where you know you you it's that necessary evil of a shipper telling you you have to do edi to keep their business or you have to do edi to get our business and so once you get that in place i mean you're either paying per load per little character or the the information that's flowing back and forth is being charged like per character and so it's very volume based and you might be paying hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a month for one shipper. And uh, so we got rid of that entirely. That, yeah, I think that goes back to the uh, the, the disruption at the, the beginning of the show and, and pricing models and where the incumbents, you know, in this world are tailoring their projects and service for that high volume. Right. And not necessarily for the, the freight brokerage with one shipper. Right. So you're paying those additional costs on that because the, the business is driven by the highly profitable customers that, that really make the most sense, that, that parade role of bringing in the most revenue and profits. So you have an underserved market there. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, when he when he started Bitfreighter and, and came up with this unlimited model, um, one of his first calls was to me and, uh, I mean, I was, I was like, I'm on board, man, let's, let's do this. Let's change things. And, and left DAT and came over and joined Bitfreighter. It's been almost a year now. And yeah, it's been fun to, to go to all these, these brokers and, and let them know that, you know, for that one shipper that they're doing EDI with, that's thousands of dollars a month, you can move that over to Bitfreighter and be paying a hundred dollars a month, $200 a month at most. And, and that like is an initial suite. We saved money, but what we want them to see is now you have the ability to scale and roll out automation to your entire shipper base. So we've kind of flipped the switch there where now brokers are reaching out 
to shippers to get them on EDI because it makes sense for the broker to automate their brokerage. And then before, for years, it was the other way around. It's the shipper is contacting the broker, forcing it down their throat. And it's a Yeah, you, you wanted to avoid at all costs. Yeah. You know, the EDI conversation, whenever you're, yeah. you're, you're talking to a shipper, you want to avoid at all costs. And that, that's where the value is. You, you said right there, the, the value is using that in the sales material, right? Now, now freight brokers just that were scared to, to, to get into EDI conversations, that's in their pitch deck, right? And then their sales presentation, right? Oh, EDI, no problem. And that's a growth mindset type of type of employment instead of just uh, just trying to cut costs, right? Cut costs on existing yeah. business is, is good, right? But but what you really want to be in position in is is have freight brokers out there actively trying to get EDI contracts or, or contracts with shippers and, and business with shippers where they can easily employ EDI resources, right? And it grows their book of business. It's all about growth all around. Yeah, what we've what what our customers are doing is uh, if they're if they're doing t- more more than ten loads a week with the shipper, now they're putting them on EDI, and mm-hmm. it's such a weird thing that that for all those years it was. It's like I don't want to automate my brokerage. It's like such a such a weird thing to think oh, it, about now. It is. It is because it was, it was cost prohibitive. It, it took time. It was a very confusing process, right? To, to, to be able to do that, especially with, with multiple shippers, but um, you know, disruption happens. And if you can do that, if those tools are available, if they're easy to use, if they're cost effective, then it's a, a, a really valuable sales tool to go out to the market and promote and employ and finally, automate a lot of things that you never, never automated before. That that most other industries have automated, you know, ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we started with that approach. It was uh, obviously very appealing, and then we we came in with the the other mindset of let's be focused on freight. Let's let's bring people into our staff that have freight backgrounds. And so that solves the other part of EDI and those integrations where it's difficult, um, where we come in, we have freight backgrounds. Um, so we know what brokers are dealing with. We know the timelines involved. Uh, so that, that service standpoint is very important to us as well. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the other part of it is that that service model and that difficulty model and we want to take all that that off the the broker's plate and you know if you send us something we connect same day to your shipper and then and start testing right away so that's another thing that was just like the stigma of edi automation is it's going to take forever it's it's Mm -hmm. uh whenever i send it over it's going to be months before i'm even getting loads automatically from the, from my partner. So it's, uh, yeah, we've, we've solved that too. And it's, it's, it's cool to offer that, that service side to it. Yeah, it is very cool. Dave, we get, got a couple minutes here left. Um, let, let's finish on, on quoting and we we're talking about automation. Let, let's talk about quoting automation and what you guys are doing with that. Yeah. Um, so about a year ago we were, uh, we were contacted by one of our partners on the shipper TMS side and and they were, they were starting to get into this real time rating instant quoting world, which uh, if for people who aren't familiar with that, um, the instant quoting real time rating is, is an, in, is a direct API connection to a shipper system. So uh, if you have a shipper that's using like a major platform, they have the ability to do instant quoting. And I mean, just like the very high level, what that means is a shipper can enter freight into their shipper TMS and have the option to get an instant quote at that moment from their preferred partners. So to be a preferred partner, you need to be able to participate in this, this real time rating instant quoting marketplace. And and uh, so what we what we built was a quoting platform that's a standalone platform that's very easy to get set up and be able to have APIs 
a direct connection with your shipper. So at a real world level, you have a, a load planner on the shipper side that enters in freight into their system and they can click a button at that moment that says, give me a quote from my preferred partners. And so they click that, it delivers an instant quote straight to them in that moment and they have the ability to accept that. And then we use EDI to push that into the broker TMS and notifications go off that, hey, you just got awarded freight from shipper XYZ. That's great. It's, yeah. That's perfect. And to learn more about Pitfreighter, you can go to Pitfreighter, you know, you can find you on LinkedIn. Uh, is it Bitfreighter.com? Bitfreighter.com. Uh, we'll be at TIA perfect. as well, booth 211. So we'll we'll see you there. Perfect. Thanks. And that wraps it up for this uh, episode of Put That Coffee Down. I got friends only want to talk business. I got expensive because when is expensive. I got expensive because when is expensive. I've been reading out of work. And I've been shutting out the stars. <laughs>